On January 17, 1994, the ashes of Harry Lehua Komoku and his wife, Alice Takeuchi Komoku, were interred at Homolani Memorial Park in Hilo, Hawaii. The man, considered by many to be the founder of Hawaii's modern labor movement, had at last come home. Born in Hilo on October 3rd, 1905, Harry Lihua Komoku spent a typical childhood attending school and doing a lot of swimming and fishing. At the tender age of 16, apprentice seaman Komoku left Hawaii to see the world. He joined the Sailors Union of the Pacific. Following his honorable discharge as a seaman, he went on to serve as Chief Quartermaster Matson Navigation Company's SS Wilhelmina. Along the way, Harry witnessed the struggles of seamen and dock workers. He learned firsthand about brotherhood and solidarity. The value of organizing workers became apparent when he walked the picket line in San Francisco during the 1934 West Coast Maritime Strike. The bitter dispute between longshoremen and powerful ship owners ended with a 30-hour work week, higher wages, coast-wide contracts, and a union-run hiring hall, effectively putting an end to discriminatory hiring practices. It was here he met Harry Bridges of the International Longshoremen's Association, forerunner of the International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union, or ILWU. It was Harry Bridges who introduced Harry Komoku to the possibilities of organizing workers in Hawaii. Harry Komoku returned to the islands determined to do just that. As a longshoreman on the Hilo waterfront, Harry told his fellow workers that a union could bring them fair hiring practices and safe working conditions. In 1935, Harry, along with 30 co-workers of various ethnic and racial backgrounds, formed the Hilo Longshoremen's Association, agreeing to work together to unite all dock workers. When a longshoreman was struck in the face by a walking boss, Harry led the first Hilo Longshore strike. Employers considered him an agitator, a Bolshevik, leader of the wharf rats. To his union brothers, however, he was a leader who had the strength and courage to stand up and fight for a decent life for all working people. Well, I started with him in 1935, October. That's when the union started. My thinking and Harry's thinking is about the same. Because I walked down there, I seen how they work. The farming and the walking boards, they just would tell you, you do this, do that. I seen a, a guy fell down. When he, the, his partner pulled up, has about this guy fell down, down in the hole, as the second day, and the guy hit his head on a on the beam underneath, and he dropped down below. I went down there to pick the guy up. I picked the guy up, his head spring on the back, and he was bleeding to his mouth and his nose. See, and I got shocked. <laughs> the first guy I seen did, <laughs> and so. <laughs> I got shot, see, I couldn't move. So the other guys came down and put me in a, you call it Opala box, the tub, eh? and take them out. As a result of his organizing efforts, Harry was fired and blacklisted. But not being able to work as a longshoreman didn't stop him from trying to achieve labor unity. The islands remained locked in a vice-like grip of a handful of family-run companies known as the Big Five. Inhumane treatment dangerous working conditions, and discriminatory hiring practices that often pitted one racial group against another still existed. These were the driving forces behind his push to organize dock workers. With the conditions, they force you to work. They don't think about your life. Your life don't mean nothing. So why should we go down there and walk? My mother used to stay home and hear the the uh, siren blowing, going up the hospital, the old Hill Hospital. And every time she thinks that I'm, maybe it's me uh, in the ambulance. She asked me to quit civil orders for some other job. When we were working at a stevedore, it's not guaranteed whether you're going to get a job or not. Hmm? See, what it does is they point the finger at you. So when they point the finger at you, you're taught, well, he's calling you, but he's not calling, he's calling the one right in front of you. That's what they does you know, all the time. To reach his goal, Harry actively sought the help of those who were close to him, like his cousin, Israel Komoku. We work together. We do a lot of things during those days. 
So then when he began to organize the longshoremen, so he asked me to join with it, so I did. I did. My, myself, my brothers, he was all the way out, you know, to help the poor, you know, to bring everybody together. Let's start, organize ourselves so that we can fight against the big fives. By that, we can ask for more wages. You know, those days, you work 20 cents an hour. Hmm? Sometimes you work till midnight. You only get 20 cents an hour. Sometimes no meal at all. Hmm? So when Harry started this, we were all for it. We joined with Harry. See, we went all to hardship and hell. Hmm? When Harry came in, he started, you know, uh, leading us, we went all along because Harry was sincere, see. And this, this is one thing that I remember, see. He was sincere. And then uh, the way he was, he was down to earth, you know, make everybody like him. And this is where he won the respect of the uh, Hilo Longshoremen. And this really helped organize the unit. The Hilo Longshoremen's Association sent an application for charter to the International Longshoremen's Association. The application was accepted, but Harry didn't stop there. The HLA also helped organize Hilo dock clerks, Hawaii Consolidated Railway workers, Mana Transportation Teamsters, garage workers, laundry workers, Koenig plant employees, store clerks, and the electric company employees. This was part of Harry's vision, to unite all workers. In an article written for the Voice of Labor, he stated, We cannot isolate ourselves. We must unite all workers of Hawaii if we are ever to show our strength. A federation built along industrial lines is the only solution for Hawaii's working class. Harry's determination and persistence paid off when in 1937, the Hilo Longshoremen's Association became the first union in Hawaii's history to be recognized as a valid bargaining agent for its workers. In 1989, I had the privilege of portraying Harry Lehu of Kamoku in the Rights and Roses production of Brothers Under the Skin. The dramatization depicted Harry's often noted skill in uniting workers of various races. Well, the next time one of our men gets injured or manhandled, we all get together and we stop the job. We tell them that nothing moves on these docks unless they do this or they do that. See, we got them. So they're telling me if it's going to be like Honolulu, you know, where the union they're making over there not accepting Orientals, Japanese guys. I tell them, no, look, they're accepting me. I'm a booty head boy. They say, but what about us? They don't even ask us guys. What can I say? Kai, you tell them that Harry Komoku said that we want everybody in with us. But Kai, do you want them in? Yeah, I think that's what they want. Hey. Some of these guys are pretty akamai, Harry. They've been learning about the unions on the ships, too. They say, if we don't bring them in, we're going to flop. Some of these guys is pretty sharp. They know all about that union things, all that legal stuff. Kai, as long as they can get along with everybody, it's OK with me. We don't want to keep anybody out. Thanks, Harry. I was hoping you would let them join, because I really want to. Now they're going to know why I'm always saying, Harry Komoku is a good man. Harry Komoku is for all working men, even the Japanese. Okay, Kai. Well, Harry was a kind of fellow, quiet, quiet man. But when he starts talking, he talks. But they're very soft, you know, and very sincere, too. That's the thing I remember him well. So what, Pasquale, huh? I want you to join. I'm going to tell you right now, Pasquale, we're not going to make it without you Filipinos. Okay, I join. I make the promise. I keep the promise. Hey, Rudy is already with us. I mean, 100%? I go along with it. Harry and the old boys together, say, we all stuck together, say, you heard the motto, injury to one is injury to all, right? and we live by that motto there. 
This is what kept the union strong. They didn't mention that slowly, but they left out the, the last part of it. An injury to one is an injury to all, for we are brothers and sisters under the skin. A black man you cut there, does a black blood come up? Red. And if a white man, does he bleed white blood? No, red. So never mind the color of our skin. See? That's one of our policies we brought for it. And that was Harry Kamoko believed. For all the races to make a union, we all have to be like a family. You know, you have differences sometimes. Or you fight, but you always work it out. No more of this I am right because I'm better than you kind of stuff. Boys, we all work in the stiffs. On those docks, we are all the same. Makes no difference what color you are. Regardless of your race or color, we all bleed red. White skin, brown skin, black. We all have red blood in our veins. All of us in this union, our family, Ohana, all of us are brothers, brothers under our skin. The dramatization, Brothers Under the Skin, is based on the events surrounding the Inland Boatman Strike of 1938 and the demonstration at the Hilo Waterfront, which became known as Bloody Monday or the Hilo Massacre. It was a show of solidarity by some 250 men and women representing various unions, including the IOWU, United Laundry Workers, United Quarry Workers International Union of North America, and the Teamsters. These scenes are from a film of the actual demonstration on August 1st, 1938. Although these people were not on strike, they held the demonstration in support of their unknown longshoremen brothers in Honolulu, who were striking against Inter-Island Steam Navigation Company. What started as a peaceful demonstration, a civic lesson in passive resistance, ended in bloodshed. When the shooting stopped and the smoke cleared, 50 people, including two women and two children, lay injured. Bert Nakano was the most seriously wounded. He has needed a cane ever since that bloody Monday. After I got shot up, I spent uh, 17 months in the hospital. Then after coming out of the hospital, 19 months, I was home recuperating. Actually, I didn't work for three whole years until the unit, you know, called a meeting. And so I was elected as the secretary of treasury and started working under Harry. The Hilo massacre left the budding labor movement badly shaken. But still, Harry and those who believed in it fought on, realizing the time had come to bring sugar and pineapple workers into the ranks. Their large numbers were seen as the key to the Union's success. Then came World War II. Harry was drafted at the age of 37, the upper limit for draftees. The Big Island Draft Board, comprised of local businessmen, saw this as a way to behead the growing Union movement. They were wrong. Harry Komoku spent three and a half years in the Army. He served in the Pacific Theater as a medical corpsman. Following an honorable discharge in 1945, Harry returned to the Big Island to resume his work as president of IOWU, Local 136. Under his leadership, the membership flourished, with the rank and file coming mostly from the island's sugar and pineapple industries. And when he was uh, elected as a president of the local, this is when I got to know him as a trade unionist, what kind of person he was. And uh, his principal objective to serve the working the working mass is shown vividly and uh, I respect it in that area that we have a great leader who don't, he don't tend to ram